This video will provide a short summary of this week's lecture and a focused close reading to prepare you for seminar. The central focus of this week's lecture was the forceful juxtaposition of expectations and reality that dominates Henry James's Daisy Miller. One of the central expectations that the main character of the novella brings to the events of the text is that people are easy to fit into neat categories. Winterbourne believes that he should be able to find the formula that explains Daisy and allow him to perfectly understand her actions and her motives. The reality, of course, is that people are not so easy to categorize. Every time Winterbourne believes he's found the formula to explain Daisy, she does something to make him question her yet again. Is she a harmless American flirt and a nice girl? Or a rather wild girl, a young lady whom a gentleman need no longer be at pains to respect? One of the ways in which James explores expectations versus reality is in the setting of this novella. As I suggested in the lecture, Daisy Miller is set abroad, following characters who are on holiday, outside their natural habitat. This is because within the tourist experience, expectations naturally come head to head with reality. A destination is never quite what one expects from a tourist guidebook. Following a group of tourists is further useful to James to consider the issue of expectation versus reality, because placing characters outside their normal habits and routines allows them to look at their society, their customs, and even themselves from an outside perspective. Things that seemed normal or natural to them are revealed to be culturally contingent. Winterbourne suggests repeatedly that he's unable to understand Daisy because she is an American, and as a man who has lived in Europe for many years, he doesn't know whether her behavior is normal for American girls or shocking even in her own country. This introduces the idea of cultural relativism, or the idea that what we consider moral or good and what we consider bad is culturally contingent. The same act might be moral in one country and immoral in others. Thus, morality ceases to be a black and white issue of good versus bad. Instead, it's a murky gray area that leaves Winterbourne unable to decide if Daisy has acted wrongly or not. Travel and tourism during the 19th century further served to break down traditional class boundaries. People of different class backgrounds mixed abroad in ways they never would have at home. Daisy is of the nouveau riche, that is, new money. Her father is a businessman, meaning they're decidedly middle class, without the cultivation of the upper or aristocratic classes. Yet, they have the money to visit the same destinations as those upper classes. Daisy does not behave like an upper class girl, but nor does she behave like the stuck up upper class people in the novel think she will. Thus, Winterbourne's aunt is disturbed to note that Daisy possesses taste, something that money supposedly can't buy. Winterbourne's expectations of Daisy's behavior are further thwarted in regards to gender. He believes he knows how a good girl would behave, but Daisy resolutely refuses to conform to the standards of behavior for a girl of her age during this period. It's not her misbehavior, however, that troubles Winterbourne, but the suspicion that she's still a good girl, by which he means a virgin, despite her behavior. This suspicion unsettles the whole of Winterbourne's understanding of morality and proper etiquette, just as cultural relativism does. It reveals a world of greys, where he wants black and white. This is why he's relieved in the final pages of the novella to be able to write her off as a fallen woman, a bad girl. If that were true, then she would be easy to categorize, and Winterbourne's expectations would have been borne out. This is not the case, however. His expectations are undone at every turn, and he's left to live with the knowledge that he did Daisy a great injustice in his estimation of her and to live with the knowledge that the world does not conform to black and white morals. In the rest of this video, I'm going to do a close reading of the second paragraph of the novella to prepare you for your seminar activities. In the introduction to the Penguin Classics edition of Daisy Miller, David Lodge writes, Henry James was one of the first writers to grasp, theoretically as well as intuitively, the importance of point of view in telling a story. Point of view, Lodge says, is a fundamental choice that will determine the meaning and effect of any story. 
As the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms tells us, the point of view of a story is the position or vantage point from which the events of a story seem to be observed or presented to us. The chief distinction usually made between points of view is that between third-person narratives and first-person narratives. A first-person narrator's point of view will normally be restricted to his or her partial knowledge and experience, and therefore will not give us access to other characters' hidden thoughts. Gaskell's old nurse's story is an example of a first-person perspective, as are the dramatic monologues we read this term. A third-person narrator may be omniscient, and therefore show an unrestricted knowledge of the story's events from outside or above them. Often, in 19th century novels, an omniscient narrator will take the form of an intrusive narrator, who, in addition to reporting the events of a novel story, offers further comments on characters and events, and who sometimes reflects more generally upon the significance of the story. This is the narrative voice of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, in which the narrator has full knowledge of the story's events and of the motives and unspoken thoughts of all the various characters, but also speaks directly to the reader, offering moral commentary upon the events of the story. While the omniscient third-person narrator is common in the 19th century novel, there is another kind of third-person narrator who confines our knowledge of events to whatever is observed by a single character or small group of characters. This method is known as limited point of view. We could also use the term focalization to describe point of view. Events presented by an omniscient third-person narrator are said to be non-focalized, whereas a story presented from a single character's perspective would be said to be internally focalized. So, what kind of narrative is Daisy Miller? The beginning of the second paragraph of the novella opens with an I. I hardly know. Now, this would normally signal a first-person narrative. Yet, this story is not about the I, but rather the him of this paragraph, the young American of some seven and twenty years of age, Frederick Winterbourne. A first-person narrative is told by a narrator who appears within the events related most often as the central character or an important participant in the action described. This doesn't describe the I of Daisy Miller, so we can assume we're dealing with an intrusive narrator here, a third-person narrator who speaks directly to the reader. Daisy Miller, then, is a third-person narrative, but not one like the one we saw in Oliver Twist. After all, this narrator begins his tale by admitting that he hardly knows something. He's not omniscient, then. Lodge writes that Daisy Miller is an early example of James's mastery of the single, limited, and fallible point of view. The title implies that Daisy is the subject of the tale, but everything we as readers know about her is filtered through the consciousness of Winterbourne. The narrative voice constructed in this second paragraph of the story is a complex one. It's not omniscient, and in fact, the claim to hardly know extends to Winterbourne himself. It's Winterbourne's thoughts that the narrator says he can hardly know. This initially suggests that our viewpoint is limited to even less than what Winterbourne knows or feels. However, the intermingling of the narrator's voice with Winterbourne's in this paragraph suggests another possibility, which is that Winterbourne also hardly knows what he's thinking about in this idle moment, except that it's charming. This would suggest that rather than a narrator who doesn't know his own characters, we're dealing with a character who doesn't know his own mind. Lodge notes that the narrative choice of a limited third-person voice means that the reader is not just asked to make up our minds about Daisy, but also about Winterbourne and the reliability of his perceptions and judgments. I said that the I at the start of this paragraph signals that we're dealing with an intrusive narrator, but He's not a very intrusive one. Lodge, in fact, calls the narrative voice unobtrusive and self-effacing. The voice is so unobtrusive, in fact, that it can be hard to tell what information is coming straight from Winterbourne and what is not. There are moments in which the voice clearly breaks with the main character, as when, later in the novella, he wryly comments, poor Winterbourne. In this paragraph, 
there are several moments of ambiguity about just how limited this perspective is, particularly in reference to what Winterborn's friends and enemies say about him. We hear reports of gossip that circulates in Geneva about Winterborn. Do you think this is gossip that Winterborn is aware of, or are we being presented with information that Winterborn could not know? Is this a slip into an omniscient narrative voice? The ambiguity here is created by James's use of free, indirect discourse, a technique which blends third and first person narration by maintaining the speech patterns of a character outside of directly quoted speech, rendering their thoughts into third person narration. We can see evidence of this in the passage on the screen. We transition from the narrator's voice alone, when his enemies spoke of him, to what we might suspect is Winterborn's own assessment of himself, that, after all, he had no enemies, he was an extremely amiable fellow, and universally liked. The previous ambiguity about whether it was the narrator or Winterborn who did not know Winterborn's thoughts should make us distrust this statement. After all, do we think Winterborn is a good judge of his own character? The final lines of this extract also slip into free, indirect discourse, as we hear the account Winterborn gives people of his reason for spending so much time in Geneva. Winterborn's diction, as in the smugness of the final line, suggests that we cannot believe the information given here. Lodge notes how little difference there is between the narrator's voice and Winterborn's, writing, There is so little difference between the style of the authorial voice and that of Winterborn's own speech that we have very little sense of moving outside his own consciousness. Lodge contends that the easy slippage between the narrator and Winterborn maintains the effect of being in Winterborn's head. I would argue further that this narrative style, which in the beginning of the passage purports to be objectively observing Winterborn from a distance, but which cannot, even by the end of this very same paragraph, maintain that distance, actually mirrors the way in which Winterborn approaches his study of Daisy. Before your seminars this week, then, I invite you to consider the presentation of Winterborn. What kind of a narrative voice does he have? How much can we trust Winterborn's assessment of Daisy, or even himself?